You are listening to the API The Docs podcast. We are here to talk about API documentation upstream and downstream. These are behaviors of developers, patterns in behaviors of developers, not only uh, those developers who actually uh, consume APIs, but any developer, and uh, not only those developers who are professionals. This is a very important thing because not only uh, those people code who are programmers, People sometimes uh, learn how to code by themselves, or sometimes they are required to learn some coding uh, because of their jobs. There are different patterns in how developers approach coding, uh, and the three types that you mentioned emerged. So I would say the documentation types that they need will depend on their motivations and their skill levels. So we have to ensure that developers with all skill levels can find information that can help them move to the next step on their journey. A lot of times the lack in the knowledge is not API specific, but rather programming language specific. The point when I finally understood this kind of documentation I was looking at at the time was when I understood object-oriented programming, because then the pieces fall into their places. Mm -hmm. I can really relate to the observation that some uh, developers think about programming as something that induces flow, and they really like prepare for the experience, and they are really frustrated if they have to get out of this state. Hello and welcome to the API The Docs podcast. Your host today and myself, Annette Pozsár and my colleague Laura Vas. In our daytime jobs, we research and build developer portals at Pronovix. Hi, Laura. Hi, Annette. And welcome, everyone. Let me introduce uh, our colleague, Amesha Hallgató to you, who is a, a UX researcher at Pronovix. And we invited her today because uh, she just published a new article about the learning habits of developers. And we found that very, very insightful and interesting. And we would like to ask her some things about that. And I'm going to show yourself, uh, you have a very, very interesting um, way into developer portals being a UX researcher, which I, I find fascinating and, well, very appealing to myself. So um, how did you become a UX researcher and what do you do today? Hi everyone. Um, how I became a UX researcher, that was a... Hmm. I started as a psychologist. I worked at the university for quite some years, for 10 years almost. And uh, after I decided that I wanted to do something else, and UX research was something that felt like the right choice because I could still do research, which I love, but it's more... Um, human-centered. This might sound weird because psychology seems to be a human-centered discipline, but um, I, I was doing research and that was really theoretical and I wanted to come to the real world. And UX research helped me coming closer to the real world from theory. Was it a big jump from your studies at university and the ideas that you picked up there and the way you looked at um, people or... It's just a different set of glasses and that's that. I would say just a different set of glasses. Mm -hmm. mm, and what is the thing that you would say surprised you the most in this change from theoretical research to, to analyzing the actual behavior? <laughs> um, when I was a researcher at the university, we had to make sure and we had to put a lot of effort into uh, being really systematic in our researches. So to exclude any uh, contextual influences that might arose, um, we wanted to measure purely some theoretical concept. And we had to put a lot of effort into this and we had to do research with hundreds of participants and a lot of statistical analysis. It's a really systematic thing. And UX research, on the other hand, is the opposite in a way because we are trying to see the real world situation. We are not trying to exclude anything from the experiences. We want to see the whole package as it is. 
And we are not trying to be as systematic because we are not, not trying to uh, isolate theoretical concepts. We are trying to understand people. Mm -hmm. And we are just having conversations with them, asking them how they feel, what they find frustrating, how they interact with a portal or something. You said uh, the word opposite, and I'm curious about, is it counterproductive in any way? I mean, your previous uh, knowledge and the uh, work you are doing here, or have you found some beneficial connection that even boosts your UX researcher career more? I had to unlearn to be too <laughs> systematic, I think, on one hand. But uh, on the other hand, while um, it's in a way in an opposite uh, of each other, but it's still complementary. So when I, I started this job as a UX researcher, I was thinking how I should have done UX research on, on my experiments to see how people behaved and uh, how they uh, felt during the, the experiments that I have done with them because I only measure the reaction times and I don't know, look at where they look and so on. But the, this was not part of the process to ask them how they feel during executing the tasks that they had to execute. We were measuring their performance, but we were not asking them, how do you feel? Are you bored? And so on. We sometimes asked some things about that, but it was not the focus of the studies. And here we are more interested in how they feel, what are their motivations, what are their goals. And I think I can benefit from uh, my systematic approach here. And I could have benefited from <laughs> this approach at the university if I had this experience then. What does that translate to? Uh, I mean, what you look at and the questions that you ask. Uh, then um, obviously one of the things that you bring is asking the right questions in the right way so that you get data that isn't distorted too much. Now, what do you translate that into? What do you give over to your colleagues, which is um, the UX team, right? Yes, exactly. Well, uh, whenever we do research, there's always a question we are trying to answer. So I'm trying to collect data that is uh, the answer to the question we were asking from people. And I'm trying to, and here comes my systematic part, I'm trying to analyze this data to um, put it into a pattern to see what patterns emerged, how many patterns they are actually. And I'm um, uh, delivering this to my team so they do not get the whole interview and usability part. I'm just giving them the conclusions of uh, these studies. That is where I guess the that discipline and 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 meticulous uh, methodicalness comes in. That uh, you need to give opinionated uh, information to your colleagues to work with, but it has to still be as objective as possible based on the answers, and that that requires training. Exactly. Yes. Is this also how the article "How Do Developers Learn About APIs" came about? Well, this article uh, was requested for me, not the article was requested. Um, my uh, team asked me to do some research on how developers learn about APIs. And I gave them a presentation and I, I, I read a lot of scientific articles. I, I was actually quite surprised that there were scientific articles about this, but there was a lot of scientific articles about this. And I, I read those articles and it was really exciting to put the whole picture together. And I, I uh, told these conclusions to my team. And then later on, I, I wrote the article. But it was an, uh, upon a request to understand them better because the UX team is working on um, delivering solutions that fit all kinds of developers. And so in the article, uh, the first um, hypothesis is that although there's uh, multitudes of uh, attitudes, uh, pun intended, uh, in how people approach something they want to learn uh, still we can see some archetypes that would be in this case the systematic developer the opportunistic developer and the pragmatic developer when it comes to um, api documentation would you tell a little more about these three archetypes and and why did we separate them what's so what's so poignantly different that it's worth to talk about it when we're thinking about documenting apis 
Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, these are not only related to API documentation. These are uh, behaviors of developers, patterns in behaviors of developers, not only uh, those developers who actually uh, consume APIs, but any developer. And uh, not only those developers who are professionals, this is a very important thing because not only uh, those people code who are programmers, people sometimes uh, learn how to code by themselves, or sometimes they are required to learn some coding uh, because of their jobs, and they are not professional at all. Uh, they do not have the skills to write to something really complex, but nevertheless, they can manage um, something simple. And um, and these people were uh, also considered the developers. They are often called citizen developers. Um, so these, uh, this um, observation was back in 2007, if I'm not mistaken, it was quite some time ago, uh, that there are different patterns in how developers approach coding. Uh, and the three types that you mentioned uh, emerged and this, the, the the existence of these three types were also um, confirmed uh, recently. So we still think they exist. Um, the systematic programmer or the systematic approach to, to development uh, means that uh, a developer will first try to understand everything that he will need uh, to do the programming part. He will try to understand the environment, the, the coding language, the, I don't know, modules that he or she will use. Um, he will try to think about the maintenance of the code. He will try to think about the security of the code. He will try to think of the design of the code so that it will be elegant and easy to maintain and so on. And uh, these developers will enjoy the coding process very much because they will ha have every knowledge and every tools set in advance. They will have everything they need for coding and then they can code. And this is what they like. And they will get hopefully in the state of flow and they do not want to get out of it so that they will try to do everything they can that nothing comes up that is unexpected. They will try to, to plan in advance. The other uh, end of the spectrum would be the uh, opportunistic programmer or develop, developer. These developers, or um, under some circumstances, the developers will approach uh, coding in this way. Um, when somebody codes this way, he or she will learn just enough to start the process. And he or she will uh, try to gather information while coding. So one would try some code snippets. If it works fine, if it doesn't work, he will try to look for another one. Then if he or she finds a problem, something that he does not understand or she does not understand, uh, they would uh, try to find a solution on the spot. So the coding itself would be uh, alternating with problem solving and information gathering. It would not be as with a systematic who, uh, who would prepare everything in advance and then code, which they like. The opportunistic would code a bit, then get into some trouble with the code and then uh, find a solution and code again and so on. And I, I try to emphasize this, but uh, just to, to be sure, uh, opportunistic programmers are not always very skillful. Uh, they, they could be, for example, scientists like myself who, who need um, to write some code for their jobs. And they would uh, not necessarily have the skills to work any other way than this way. But even very skillful professional programmers can sometimes approach a problem this way. Uh, if they don't have the time, the energy, the motivation, the need to, to be more systematic for the particular project that they are approaching. And the third type is the pragmatic programmer or pragmatic developer who would sit between the two extremities. So they would learn just enough to start the coding. They would consider some maintenance aspects or some, I don't know, 
security aspects, but only uh, that much as is necessary. And they will not try to understand everything in advance. And how does this translate uh, to documentation they need if we are talking about the two extremes, so the two uh, end of the spectrum? What kind of documentation would they need or expect? <laughs> Well, if, if we talk about the opportunistic uh, developer who would uh, not systematically preview everything in advance, uh, as I thought, they could be skillful or not, not that skillful. If, if uh, someone is not that skillful, they would need some teaching materials for sure. Mm -hmm. That could be tutorials, how-to guides, examples. So by teaching materials, you mean not just step-by-step guides but something like descriptive or like a textbook in in the research that i've read uh from professor meng um there were some people who actually uh would have preferred something like a textbook <laughs> but but usually these step-by-step uh, -step guides could be mm -hmm. enough and tutorials could be enough of course if um, someone approaches a problem in this way but otherwise has the skills then he might not need these materials. Then he might only need the reference documentation, for example, if you are talking about APIs, because he understands that. That, that might be enough information for him or her to, to go along with the project and uh, the code. Uh, so I would say um, the documentation types that they need uh, will depend on their motivations and their skill levels. So we have to ensure that uh, developers with all skill levels can find information that can help them move to the next step on their journey. That's so interesting uh, connected to my job because um, we could uh, learn and read about more how, so when we are finding our target audience, we are tend to think more about the seniority uh, or the skills of a developer and not this, opportunistic or rather uh, systematic or pragmatic developer so it just added another complex complexity or layer to my mind since i read your um, article i also wanted to ask uh, as you mentioned you wrote code yourself as a um, scientific person can you recall what kind of uh, resources or uh, teaching materials did you use yourself this is kind of funny. <laughs> um, I, I've learned uh, programming only basics at the university. It was one course, 101. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned Python. And um, I uh, realized that if I, I code my experimental software myself, then uh, I can do a lot more than if I rely on other people's codes. And uh, so I started to learn uh, Python on my own. Um, I, I found some materials on the web um, for free that uh, that were amazing actually uh, to learn Python. And I used the tool, um, which is an open source tool for scientists, mainly for psychologists and neuroscientists, in which one can code in Python, but it also has a, a code library. This means that some Python code is pre-written mm -hmm. uh, that can be used for experiments so that one doesn't have to reinvent the wheel but we can use these codes for our experiments and that's helped a lot. And when I started to use this uh, platform, this software, uh, it was quite new back then and they didn't have much teaching materials at the time, but they did have uh, a documentation mm -hmm. uh, of these modules, of these codes, which I did not understand at all. It was really technical. It is really similar to API reference documentation, actually, how it looks. <laughs> and I didn't understand what does it mean? Why are these brackets there? What does an italic mean if something is put in italic? Or if there is an asterisk, what does it mean? I didn't have a clue. I didn't know. I didn't understand. And actually, what I would have needed at the time is an explanation on how to interpret this kind of technical uh, documentation. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I wouldn't be helped out by tutorials because my problems were really specific, unique to the projects that I was trying to, to accomplish. 
but it would have helped me a lot if I had something to explain me how to interpret this really technical kind of documentation. But I didn't have it back then, so I had to figure it out myself. It took some years. <laughs> Do you see this in, uh, in user studies, in API documentation, that there is indeed this gap that somehow needs to be bridged? The chicken or the egg problem, that you're, one is trying to use a sophisticated tool, code, uh, in which one isn't proficient. But the only way to be proficient is by using it. A lot of times, um, the lack in the knowledge is not API specific, but rather programming language specific. Mm -hmm. So in my case, for example, uh, the, the um, point when I finally understood this kind of documentation I was looking at at the time was when I understood object-oriented programming. Because then they, the pieces fall into its, their places. Mm -hmm. Um, and if someone would have told me what programming principles I need to understand first to make sense uh, of the documentation, that would have helped me a lot. But that has nothing to do with um, that tool itself, but it was yeah. more. Um, so yes, maybe um, this is something that can help people if they know in advance what kind of knowledge they will require to understand a specific topic. And this is something that we see uh, in some dev portals that mm -hmm. that they that they write there that in order to understand this, I don't know, tutorial or something, you will need to understand this and this and this with links, and this helps a lot. And this would become even sharper initial like on a developer portal uh, because because that's very special real estate there. So yep. it's super hard to select how much is too much, how much is not enough. Do you see that? Like, does it come up when uh, when you're advising on, on what technical text to put there on it? Like, this would be helpful, but but... People don't really read above the line. How? Where do we put that? That help? Like, okay, if you stumble, how can we help you further? Where does that belong? It isn't quite conceptual because that would be about the API itself, right? Yes, it's another observation that um, developers rarely uh, read the conceptual information. They don't like to read that, although that helps a lot. Uh, well, it comes up. Um, but in usability studies, you usually ask specific questions and uh, try to deliver answers to that specific question. So in order to answer your question, we need to do uh, research that is targeted at this question. What, what helps you? What would help you at this point if you're stuck, if you don't know how to move on? But there are best practices, of course, that we can advise on. Um, how, what to put on a dev portal, what teaching material, what step-by-step uh, -step guides put on a dev portal so that we can say that most of the users will be uh, served well. Can you remember some fact or information um, you find especially interesting or even surprising during this research? I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be the most important, just uh, something that you find especially mm, interesting and lives in your head rent free ever since i would say it was uh, interesting to to see that my experiences uh, were not that unique uh, so that um, other other uh, developers had the same issues that i i myself faced mm -hmm. when i was trying to learn how to code for example my uh, friends used to bug me with I, I really liked coding and I, I got into a state of flow and I was really mad when I had to get out of the state mm -hmm. because it is it is pleasurable. <laughs> so when I knew I had some uh, coding tasks to do, I, I was already happy <laughs> because I know, knew that it, it will feel good when I will be doing these tasks. And uh, I had um, a friend I was living with at the time uh, when we went to college and uh, she had a habit of trying to frighten me while I was in the zone. 
Oh, so if Chilla, if you listen to me, I can still remember that. <laughs> but I, I can really relate to the uh, observation that some uh, developers um, think about programming as something that induces flow, and they really like prepare for the experience, and they are really frustrated if they have to get out of this state. Does it only happen when you know very well how to do what you do? Which is, I think that's how Csikszentmihalyi was first saying that, like, you really need to know what you're doing to be able to even reach the flow. But um, I guess maybe some some type of flow we can also reach just by small successes, like, I've got this. Yes. Fortunately, yes, you don't have to be really proficient at anything uh, in order to get into the flow. You need optimal challenges. Mm. So whatever your skill level are, if you find the optimal level of challenge that you can jump, that you can uh, manage, it's not too easy because then you will be bored. It's not too hard because then you will be uh, anxious. So we are trying to find an experience where we are not bored and not anxious and we are really focused. Mm -hmm. And if three these three things are uh, given, then and then you can get in the state of flow. It doesn't even have to be really exhausting. It can be um, some kind of sports. I, I mean, sports can be exhausting, but I, I, mentally exhausting. I mean, you don't have to like really try to think about something in order to get into the flow. But if, if you can focus on one thing and exclude everything else, then you can get into the flow. Even it's, if it's um, low activity, low, low activity activity. Then I guess the challenge for us is to be able to mark up any kind of technical documentation in a way that people can self-select what is the level of challenge that they want at this point without having to get out of the zone just by having to make that choice at that point. Yep, I would say that there are two aspects that we have to focus on. One is that we ensure that nothing is harder than it has to be or more difficult than it has to be. And the UX team is working on this aspect a lot of times so that um, when somebody comes to a site, he can or she can find what uh, they are looking for immediately and know what to do next and so on. And the, the flow itself is not difficult or complicated. And the other thing is what you said, that uh, it would be amazing if we could, we could build uh, dev portals where every user could find the optimal challenge level so that they can uh, progress on their paths while also enjoying that. Mm. And in connection with documentation, is there something that kind of like immediately get the developer out of the flow? Well, it depends. Uh, for example, for the systematic developers, if they have to um, stop coding for some <laughs> reason, that, that will automatically get them out of the flow. Um, but in a more general term, um, whenever the task became becomes too difficult, for example, mm -hmm. unmanageable, that that might get out them off the floor. And also, if it's too easy, really, yes, because then you will get bored, uh -huh. and that's not a friend of flow. This is kind of interesting, combined with the the latest news that the average attention span right now is about eight seconds. Emma said, thank you very much uh, for your uh, insights and for the article that you wrote. Is there um, a different kind of message that you would like to uh, leave the listeners with? I would just say that whenever, uh, as a user, we face a challenge that seems too challenging, maybe trying to reframe the challenge in different terms can help us overcome it so that we can still get in the state of flow. So this is what I would say to the users, I think. And thank you for having me here. Thank you, Amesha. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. Thanks again to our guests, to Pronovix for letting us work on this, and the entire API The Docs community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. 
If you go to the website apidocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API The Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.